Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, no, Katie thinks she's about to get the microphone, but I, you know, I've got, I've got 14 seconds to burn here. I, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, <laughs> with that, um, I really hope we have some fun this weekend. I hope we get some new experience with the, with the steps. And, uh, I'm just dying to hear what Katie's going to say. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, um, hi y'all. I'm Katie. And I am an alcoholic. Hi Katie. Uh, I've had the gift of sobriety since October the 28th of 1984. That is five and a half months more than Charlie. And, uh, you know, it's funny people go, boy, your ego really comes out and that. And I said, well, everybody's does when it comes to time. You know what I mean? If we, you really want to be honest, you ask somebody, how much time do you have? And if you got more, you go like, <laughs> right? Um, but it's funny in our house sometimes when when uh <laughs> when I'll tease Charlie and I'll go, Well, honey, it'll make a little bit more sense in about five and a half months, just hang in there with it. <laughs> uh you'll see a lot of playing. We we play a lot. Charlie and I's relationship is not your normal relationship. Let me start out by saying that. We I was married for twenty years to Joe and uh I had ten minutes sober, he had six years sober. So, you know, Thank God the book says we can't be the arbiter of anyone's sex life because if anybody had stepped in, <laughs> there's no telling what could have happened. And uh, we managed to make this deal work for 20 years, and unfortunately he got very sick. And Charlie was my best friend. I, we'd met him in these rooms, but he and I gravitated together like brother and sister. I mean, Lenny and Squiggy, you know, Laverne and Shirley, for you guys that are younger, Beavis and Butthead, you know. <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. And... uh <laughs> And Which so we that? had this, we had this great relationship, like brother and sister, just teased each other and, and just had a ball. I'd go help him build fences and it was really cool. I absolutely love sobriety. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love the fellowship. I loved everything about it the day I walked in these rooms. And, uh, when Joe got sick and, and my, as my story will tell you, I was in untreated alcoholism. And what ended up happening is I gravitated towards Charlie and scared him to death. And I'm telling you, it was not on my radar. It was not in my thinking. But untreated alcoholism, the untreated alcoholism I was dealing with, the bedevilments on page 52, are, they're painful. They're very painful. And and they're not light depression. They're insanity. Stark, raven, sober is what I call it. And uh, And I am so grateful that when I, you know, made a move on my best friend and risked a 20-year best friendship. You all know what I'm talking about, right? You're, you're, I, we don't need any details. <laughs> um, it was, you know, he he was uh, quick enough to say, whoa, 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 Katie, Katie, Katie. And then, you know, I was humiliated. I'm storming out the door. And he's like 14 seconds later going, whoa, whoa, hold up, hold up now. Come Come on back. Wait, 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 wait. It was not 14 seconds. Okay, it was 18 seconds. But the truth is, is through a loving God and a lot of work, uh, you know, we managed to make this deal work. And, and people, I love it. People always say, it's great to to fall in love with your best friend. Well, it's damn hard, too. <laughs> you got a lot of history there. And it was a lot of rough roads. And, uh, you know, I'd been married all the time. And he he had three marriages. And. I didn't really care for any of them. And, uh, you know, I was his best friend. I told him that. And, uh, but the, the good thing was, is our children blended well together. My kids called Charlie Uncle Charlie. So when he, when, when my oldest had our first grandbaby, uh, she's like, so what's it? Grandpa Uncle Charlie? I mean, we're kind of, <laughs> that in a little deep south there, you know? And, uh, but, uh, it's, it's really been wonderful. And the best part though is this story about Mark. It, it's amazing, guys. I mean, when Charlie said, let's go to this big book study, I'm, I'm knee deep in untreated alcoholism. I'm digging a, a sick open discussion meeting. Do you know what that looks like? That's the one where all we're doing is complaining. 
you know, and I loved it. And I was the queen of, you know, let's talk about who we don't like. Come on, come on. And uh, you could have named the meeting uh, always in collision with somebody or something. You know, we, we didn't have a group conscience because we weren't going to do by the traditions. And, you know, when you're really in, in some deep, untreated alcoholism, you got to find a pretty sick group. And uh, because that, and now, once again, I'm not aware I'm doing any of this. This is all looking back. Once I was awakened to what was going on, it was it was pretty uh, pretty unbelievable. And when Charlie found Mark and he said, "Let's do this big book weekend," I remembered walking in there, and, and Mark was up there, and I was thinking, "Who is this guy?" And on the way up there, we listened to Chris R. and I don't know if you've ever heard him, but Chris can you, I think you either like him or you don't. It's unfortunate, but you either like him or you don't. And uh, and I've grown to love Chris, but let me tell you, the first time I heard his CD, I kept hitting that button off I go who is this guy you know how dare he say and and Charlie goes good god can we just listen to the man I'm like <laughs> whatever <laughs> flipping back on for another 15 seconds and I'm turning him back off again you know I've been sober 15 years and I've got I I've got a lot of ego rebuilt back up right so we end up hearing Mark and and I remembered I pulled Mark aside to ask him a question because I kept trying to leave. I, I tried to leave three times and we're on some you know church property down a Caliche road and it's raining. And Charlie goes, "Where are you going to go?" And I'm like, "I'm leaving. Don't I don't have a car? And I'm going to take my roller bag down that Caliche road. <laughs> Any of y'all relate to this insanity? But I'm leaving. No one is stopping me. I got nowhere to go. No way to get out of here. But I'm leaving." And uh, Mark and I were talking, and Mark had that belly laugh, and he would just, I'd tell him something, he'd go, oh, and I'd think, oh, you know, you suck too, you know. I remember, oh, oh, I was just so angry, oh, so angry. And, uh, but what ended up happening is that weekend was the beginning of the, the fire that lit. Charlie's fire lit way brighter than mine did. Mine was very slow burning. I have a tremendous ego. I am hard-headed and stubborn as can be. And I think most of us really are. It's just how it manifests in you, right? I mean, alcoholics, extreme example of self-will run riot, comma, though we usually don't think so. And so, um, but one of the things is, is that it was a slow burn for me, but I thought, you know what? These boys do know something. Something's going on. And I, I remembered going back to that sick meeting that I was a strong member of. I am not knocking that meeting. Don't get me wrong. I was a solid member of that meeting. And uh, I could not believe that I did not hear one word about alcoholism spoken. It was all about, you know, who, who we didn't like or what was going. It was just a kind, kind of constant bitching meeting, if, if, if you can have it that way. And so I, I called Charlie. I said, my God, that little punk on that CD was right. And I can't believe that this is happening. And, and I mean, I was awakened like that. Now, the road was a slow road for me because I'm so stubborn and hard-headed. And, uh, but the journey that Charlie and I went on in starting this big book study, and, and, and I love the tapers. I, besides the fact I do love Jane and Glenn very much, but I love the tapers. It, had it not been for those CDs, that I could just pop them in and listen to them over and over and rewind them and get my book out and restudy it. And Bob D was a, I'm a big fan of Bob Darrell's out of Las Vegas and I love Mark. And I just studied and studied and studied and studied. And then I began having this experience based on what they were saying. I found a female sponsor. I, I, I do like girls with girls and boys with boys. That's my own opinion. And, um, uh, she was coming out of untreated alcoholism and she happened to be a big brain. So I was very fortunate because when she studied it, she kind of got it and was able to really explain it to me. And, and so together we came out of untreated alcoholism and she lives between 60 to 63, which is the topic of our weekend, you know, uh, the root of our problems. And, uh, but what ended up happening is today, some seven years later, I, I, I sponsor about 30 women. We do the big book weekend. We, um, we've been asked to, to study the big book around the world. We've been very fortunate because we believe, and, and this is just Charlie and I's experience, that there's a lot of people sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that are unaware that there's more to be offered. They know that what they got is just okay. It's okay. 
but they're not on fire. And what I found, and I and I tell you what, I could have I could have left this lifetime and thought I had done the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I learned was I had done maybe a tenth of what the 12 steps had to offer. The God of my understanding today is, it's, there's just no comparison. I mean, God has my back like I never believed. I mean, you, I, you, I'd be hard-pressed to believe you could come at me with anything. That wouldn't certainly be painful. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but I could, I would know that God has my back. And uh, just briefly a little bit about my story. I, I was sick last week. You have to forgive me. My throat is very dry. And I'm <laughs> such a such an alcoholic. I, I have a doctor friend that called me in a Z-Pack, Tamiflu. I took Alka-Seltzer. I took Zyrtec. Uh, and one other thing until I was dizzy, but I thought, we're going to dry this damn thing up before I get to the Wilson house. Charlie goes, honey, that is too much. I'm like, I don't care. She I'll basically just raked the medicine cabinet into her mouth. I will, you know, I will I mean, be in bed for two days, and I'm going to be well. <laughs> Uh, cause we just have, I just think this place is magical, man. I mean, I, it is magical. And the last time I was here, I had a, the most unbelievable awakening to self. Uh, I may or may not tell that story, but let me tell you about me as a kid. I was, um, I'm 53 years old. I got sober when I was 26. Um, I'm, pr- I'm proud to be 53 years old. I love getting old. Imagine that. The whole world seems that getting old is a bad thing. I, I think it's a, it's a privilege. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I think you can look at it two ways. It either sucks or it's great. I think I'll take great. And um, so it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> I know a secret. You're getting older. Uh, but when I, I was a uh, third born and I was born in the 50s. And so, uh, you know, the 50s were a different time. You know, it's there were three channels on the TV. And, you know, you basically went out and rode your bike when the news came on. You know, you had a. Uh, leave it to Beaver and, and Father Knows Best and, and your mind was, you know, those images and, and, uh, I remembered at a young, my, my dad was an ex-professional football player. He was also a, a mechanical engineer for Union Carbide after he'd gotten out of playing ball and, and he, um, it was, alcohol was fun, fun, fun at our house. There was never any beatings, never any, uh, falling down drunks and fights. It was always fun. And so I grew up with the concept that alcohol was great. And uh, I remembered at about, I, it, I must have been around eight years old, hyperventilating. I don't know if any of y'all got into hyperventilating, but there's usually a handful of people in the room that did. And there is a high in hyperventilating that, you know, th- this is long before I ever took a drink. And we take that towel and we'd wrap it up and you'd strangle each other for God's sakes. But if you think about it, when we were kids in the 50s, I mean, we were riding a bicycle with no seat, pumping somebody on the handlebars. You know what I mean? All you had was that pipe coming up between your legs. Downhill. You know, there was none of all this, you know, panic-stricken parents and the helmet and the, you know, wrist guards. And and so uh, my sister and I and my brother and the neighbor kids, man, we just would hyperventilate. And uh, when you'd come out of that... Uh, you know, completely knocked out, you know, fainted stage, there was a feeling at that moment that I just loved. I dug it. Now, not every kid dug it. I mean, there were kids running out of that room with their hair on fire. You know what I mean? And I swear it could just be almost a test for alcoholism right then and there. The ones that wanted to do it again probably were alcoholic. (laughs) The ones that ran out of the room, Al-Anon's. You know what I mean? You could have just (laughs) figured it out right there. But, um, and then the other thing, and once again, this is looking back, it would never have occurred to me had we just not all sat around, uh, as alcoholics do, talking about their childhood or their life or their drinking or whatever. I loved Vicks Formula 44, the black licorice Vicks Formula 44, and I was a pretty sick kid, so I drank a lot of that. Uh, it's got as much alcohol as NyQuil. Uh, I looked it up. You know, they don't even have it on the counters anymore. Uh, but, uh, I'm tooling along, and my mom's a stay-at-home mom, and I remembered my mother was a beautiful woman, absolutely beautiful. I remembered she was educated, and um, my dad had, you know, he was just the party guy, and my, both my parents were single uh, children, so we had no aunts, no uncles, no cousins. Now, that's not unusual to me at all until I get older, and I start realizing that a lot of you people, man, you got tons of, 
I don't even really know what a cousin is, you know what I mean? And so my uh, my mother gets sick, and I, back then you weren't allowed in the hospitals when you were a child. You all remember that? You know, it's funny, the, the kids that are 30 and under have no idea that we weren't even allowed in the hospital. And so my dad says, you know, you uh, your mother's sick. It's just overnight, it felt like. We need to go to the hospital. We go in there, and she's a small woman, and she's laying in the bed. And I remember thinking, this this is not good. You know, there's machines, and she's hooked up to all this stuff, and just didn't look good at all. And my brother's uh, four years older than me. My sister's two years older than me. And I just remembered I wanted out of there. I didn't want to be in there. It was uncomfortable. Get me out of here. That People are talking about us in the hallway. You know, of course, they all knew if they saw kids in there, it was not good. And so the next day, my dad comes in and wakes us up and says, you know, your mother died last night and she died of a kidney disease that had been going on for some time but it was 1966 and you just didn't talk about that stuff back then and so my dad said we're going to make it through this and I'm telling you what he was such an entertainer he had music piped through the house we had Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass you know we had Inkelbert Humperdinck and you know dad would slide in playing the guitar it was going to be fun and that's all I remembered and in six weeks he had remarried and that's pretty quick. <laughs> that's pretty quick. I swear, my dad was a player. Now, that kind of grosses me out to think about that. But I believe my father was a player because the story gets better. <laughs> so he was married for six weeks, and this woman comes in. She's got two small kids, one younger than me. That's a problem. Uh, you know, I remember standing there by a swimming pool that had no water in it, and the little girl's looking in, and I thought, I'm shoving her in. You know, probably 12 feet to hit her head on the concrete. That's the way my mind thinks. We'll just get rid of you. You know what I mean? You are a problem gone. And uh, uh, she, the woman was there for a weekend, maybe a week, I can't remember, and gone. It was done. She, her husband had been killed in the Vietnam War, I found out later, as an adult. Um, but she was gone. And within three months, my dad remarried again. And she lasted about three months. She was beautiful. She was on the cover of Life magazine. He always had these beautiful women. And uh, I always remembered that as a kid, thinking, these are beautiful women. And I'd always say, do we get to call this one mom? You know, do we get to call this one mom? What, what's the deal? And then she was gone. And then he married another one. And so within 18 months, we had three moms and six live-in housekeepers. Now, if you'd have told me when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, that's why I was alcoholic. I'd, I'd have staked my life on that. That's how much I misunderstood the disease of alcoholism. I thought that's why I was alcoholic. I had no idea that all that did was influence my old ideas. See, I got plenty of old ideas about men and women and marriage and children, how they're raised, because that's going to come up in my inventory. Because the way we were raised is affecting, it's our old ideas. We have to let go of them absolutely, right? I have old ideas when I drank. I have moral and philosophical convictions galore. Can't live up to him. I can't live up to him sober. Can't live up to him drunk. So that's what made me begin to understand that my alcoholism started long before I took the drink. I am absolutely driven. When the book says selfishness and self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles, driven by a hundred forms of fear, that self-centered fear will make me, I will die to prove a point to you. That's how crazy I can get. You know what? And if you dared me as a kid, I'd risk my own life just to prove I could do it. I remember they threw a, a, a I swear, it just had to be stupid dads came up with this idea. At the pool, they threw a watermelon in the water that was Vaseline, like you're going to ever eat it. You know what I mean? You can never get the Vaseline off of it. But I remember they threw that in the water and they said, you know, a group of kids, you get to dive in. Whoever gets the watermelon out of the water gets it. And I remember being under that water and thinking I was going to die, that I was I was getting ready to drown, but I was going to get that watermelon out of there, by God. I mean, that's the insanity. That would never cross my mind until I got deeper and deeper into this book and started seeing how when I took the first drink, I started drinking at 12. And when that that drink did for me, oh, my God, I just remembered thinking, this is great. I love this feeling. Now, what I understand today is alcohol was the only thing that calmed the beast of self-centeredness in me. See, I had no idea that living in this mind 
of driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity were what drove me. And that booze, man, that was just, oh, that was heaven. And we did a ton of outside issues. It was it was the uh, 60s and 70s. And, you know, my brother was on the east side finding the bad stuff. I'm in the third grade. You know, it was terrible. I was so young. And but being the youngest, you you just followed suit. My dad's jumping in and out of the hay with nine million women, you know, and he is just not paying attention, if you know what I mean. And um, so we had a lot of freedom, a whole lot of freedom. And uh, but what I ended up doing, you know, when you're when you're young and you're drinking, I don't know about you guys. There was plenty of booze in our house, but you could only drink so much booze, and then you were going to get caught stealing the booze, right? So so you had to sit in front of the Seven Eleven. And wait for creepy guy. And creepy guy, look at, I always love the way the women always go, oh, I hadn't thought about creepy guy for a long time. <laughs> and you gotta wait for creepy guy to pull up and, uh, and get him to buy you the booze. And I know that the creepy guy is sitting in this room, aren't you? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I married him. And, uh, but what you got is, you know, you get this guy to buy you the booze. And I, I can't tell you, I mean, we're 14 years old, but I'm assuming he was probably about 30 ish. And, uh, and then you had to try to get rid of him. It's like flicking a booger off your finger, man. You just can't, you gotta, you gotta bob and weave in the woods and on your bicycle and you're pumping to get down to the place you can drink the, you know, the Boone's farm. And, and, uh, but that's to me was booze was so much fun. It was fun for a long time for me. I uh, I couldn't live at home. I couldn't live under the rules that my parents had. The last mother, the third mother, um, ended up staying. As a matter of fact, she's been my stepmother uh, since then. I was 10. And um, my father has passed away since then. But she has, uh, she has certainly been a rock in our family. But um, I ended up, I could not live under the rules of our household. They drove me crazy. I, I've never liked rules. I don't know about you guys, how well you do with them, but I can tell you I don't care for rules. And uh, so I told my dad, we, he and I constantly fought, constantly fought. And he said, you know, if you can't live by these rules, you're out of here. That's fine. Once again, don't forget the kid you're dealing with, man. I'm out of here. And I mean, I packed my stuff. I called my boyfriend. He came and picked me up and I moved out and I never went home. And, but it, interesting Interesting when you look back was I was going to prove to my father that I could live on my own. I was going to finish high school because back then it was it was a very interesting time. People were actually dropping out of high school, and I could not wrap my brain around understanding that. I thought, why would you make it this far and quit? I just thought that was such a loser. But what ended up happening from my mother died when I was in the second grade, and I don't think before I was in the second grade, I was really learning anything anyway, but I remembered not liking school at all. I didn't, they would talk and I just thought, oh, this is just not my cup of tea. I'd rather be visiting with my friends. And so I lost um, any sort of interest in, in education. And what ended up happening is the older I got, I realized, and, and trust me, I was very well liked in school. I was voted everything you could be voted, most likable. The nerds loved me. The jocks loved me. You know, I, I ran with the heads, you know what I'm saying. And so everybody loved Katie. So they passed me along for a long, long time. But what ended up happening is I had to cheat. And, and I'm not talking just look on your paper cheating. I'm talking professional cheater. I'm, I'm leaving the window unlocked so I can break back into the school. All you needed was a number two pencil. Are you with me on that? Thank God before computers, you could get away with a lot with a number two pencil, man. You just broke in. The teacher's, you know, grades were right there. You just erased it, put the correct grade in there. And, I, you know, the, the report cards were not computerized. Everything was a, a pencil. And uh, the older I got, I had to get more and more crafty. And the reason this is so important is because when when I'm getting sober, I've got a ton of old ideas, guys. They're driving my life crazy. The, the insanity behind when the alcohol was removed, I thought I had this deal licked. I thought my problem was booze, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Booze is a serious problem. I mean, as a matter of fact, if I drink again, it will be the relief because I will have been in the bedevilments. If you drink with time, you're either going to shoot yourself or kill yourself in some fashion or drink, right? 
I mean, that's what happens to us guys with time. If you've got any time, you've seen it in this program, and it's heartbreaking. And that's that level of pride. So that's the bedevilments that I lived in long before I took that drink. The drink would actually be the relief, right? And so I've got to uncover and discover what it is in Katie that drives me absolutely insane. And so um, when I when I share with you this these these old ideas I have, they follow me all my life. I made my life up. My life is my perspective. It's my delusion. It's the way I see things. I don't see them the way you see them. I only see them the way they affect me. And so what ended up happening is the older I got, I had to get way more crafty <laughs> at cheating because I had to I had to graduate. I had to get that diploma. And so I'm living there. I'm wa- you know washing and waxing cars for teachers. I'm I'm you know mowing yards. I'm doing whatever I can. I was renting a little bitty house. For sixty-two fifty a month, it you know pulled up right by the shrimp boats. They threw their anchor basically in my backyard. You know, I mean, it it would not be where you'd want your daughter living. Let's just put it that way. And so um, I, I convinced my best friend to let me have dinner at her house that night because her mother was the English teacher, and I uh, broke into her briefcase so that I could steal the test, so that I could pass the test. Right? You want to hear a great story? I'm speaking what. A year and a half ago, it never occurred to me that I needed to make an amends to this English teacher. Just didn't occur to me. I loved the story. Everybody laughed. Oh, oh, crafty little girl. I'm sitting in this meeting and I'm getting ready to speak at this conference. And I look out and I go, oh, my God, there's Miss Shaw. And Charlie goes, honey, are you okay? And I was like, oh, my God, that's the English teacher that I broke into her briefcase i a can't tell the story, story yeah. <laughs> and b i better make an amends before i get out of here right she's been sober 26 years isn't that something that english teacher yeah it was very very cool i mean i just they, they were getting ready to introduce me i'm like give me a few minutes man so i go over there i said is she, are you are you miss shaw she's like well yes i am but well okay we need to talk after this meeting but um this was this was a day in the life of me I'm a con artist, I'm a liar, and I'm a thief. And I'm a, I was raised middle America, man. I mean, I had, if my dad, you know, my, I, I didn't need to steal. I did it all. I just, everything to me was a challenge to what Katie could get away with. And as it, you know, my life just spun out of control. I ended up getting pregnant. Um, I have to tell you today, education for me is not what I need to be okay there are a lot of people in this program that cheated themselves and robbed themselves out of education, and they need to get an education because they felt they were cheated. Please understand that I'm not saying that's not what you should do. As a matter of fact, I'm I, I'm always impressed. Me, on the other hand, could care less. I don't really dig education. I'm, my husband loves history. We go to the Alamo. The guy's explaining the line in the sand and the cannonball, and I'm over there going. And Charlie's got a tear in his eye. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, my God, when are we going to the Alamo, for God's sake. When are we going to go have a cup of coffee? (laughs) Please don't take me to another museum. (sighs) You know, his his mother was a first-grade teacher for 42 years. She doesn't grasp it. I don't care for education. But... For me, it's just not my cup of tea. I've been a successful businesswoman, self-employed, which is what you need to be if you're going to choose not to do school. (laughs) That's about the only way you're going to make a good living. And I make a darn good living. I was 15th in the world in what I chose to do. I mean, I'm smart. I just don't care for education. And you will see it will come up this weekend. Trust me. So when I come into Alcoholics Anonymous at 26 and they hand you a book, I mean, come on. I'm not the only one in here who doesn't comprehend. How many of y'all were like, are you kidding me? A book? Is somebody going to read it to me? I mean, is somebody going to explain it to me? I mean, this is not good news. For Yeah, for the person who doesn't. I mean, I can read. Don't get me wrong. I can read. I can't spell very well, but I can read. I just can't comprehend. I can read three pages, and then if you tell me what I just read, I got nothing. I mean, I read murder mysteries, and I'm still... Why they can't keep up with four names. I mean, let's just do four people's names. You know, you're bringing in another character. I can't handle it. <laughs> oh. But, uh, and I always joke that my kids are going to find all my 
uh, writings, and I put in here, I write a lot of notes, and I wrote the word obsession, U-P-S-E-S-S-I-O-N, <laughs> obsession. Charlie goes, Katie, we can fix that. I said, don't touch it. Kind of proud of that. <laughs> we can turn it. You we can make it. We can make it all work. But what ended up happening, guys, and, you know, I got about five minutes left, is that I came into um, Alcoholics Anonymous desperately needing this program. I had a five-year-old. That poor child had been drugged through the, the mud. Uh, she had no business being anywhere that I took her. Uh, my life went downhill. Oh, my, my, my life went downhill very, very fast. Uh, I'll tell you what, for you guys that have kids, drinking and children do not go together well at all. They like to get up early. That's a problem. They like to eat regularly. That's another problem. They need to go to bed and get plenty of sleep, and they cost a lot of money at the babysitter. All these are problems. But by golly, I was going to do it. And it got, when she was three, she really should have been taken from me. And she's 32 years old. We have an incredible relationship today. Um, I've been sober since she was five. We certainly had our ups and downs. Uh, she has our first grandson, who's four. And um, unfortunately, she um, relived a lot of her childhood when he started, when he turned three and four. And she got very resentful at me. And we had a, it was not, it was just uh, six months ago, we had a tough run. And we sat down, thank goodness this program has allowed us to sit down. And it's allowed me to sit there and listen to her tell me how painful it was for her to be, you know, left unattended with no food and blah, 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 blah. And, and for me to sit there with no guilt, no shame. You know what I mean? I, I do not have guilt and shame. I'm telling you. It's it's wonderful to be that free. I am so sorry she's experiencing that pain. But I got to tell you, the freedom that we can have, the ninth step promise me, is me amazing promises. They all do. I love the tenth step promises. But they give me these things where this is my daughter's natural ebb and flow. She had a child, and she saw what it requires to be a mother and I didn't have those skills. Alcoholism will cut everything in your life away. And so what ended up happening is I get sober. Joe, my husband, that we're, you know, he's got six years more than me. We are, he gets very, very sick uh, and has a brain tumor, and it's terrible. Um, I'll tell that story when we're talking more about the third step. But, well, you know what, I better tell it now because I may forget <coughs> it, and it's a crucial story. The he was a very sick man. We couldn't figure out what it was. A girlfriend of mine, we didn't have good insurance, and a girlfriend of mine says, you can drive a school bus, and you'll get instant medical insurance. Now, remember, I will spin the plates, man. I'll bring home the bacon. I'll fry it up in the pan. What do we need to do? I'm the go-getter, right? And so I go to drive a school bus. Can you imagine that? Let's just take a moment to think about that, okay? I have got a whole career going, right? I am a mass producer, in my business, and I'm driving a school bus with a wooden stick where you got to beat the wheels, and you want to beat the kids with it 90% of the time. <laughs> but I mean, I am, you know, I'm going to do this bus for a window of opportunity. I'm just going to do this bus for a small period of time till my husband gets his head checked. Well, we go into the emergency room, and the doctor does the CAT scan, and he comes back in. I'll never forget. He puts his hand here. He goes, my God. He's got a massive massive tumor in his head. It's huge. It's the size of a grapefruit. And I remembered my first thought was, oh my God, I am going to be driving this school bus forever. <laughs> that was my first thought. Because that's how self-centered I am. That That is how awake I am to the level of self-centeredness that I'm at. Now, I didn't say anything, and I didn't act on it. But do you know my husband being that sick, Man, I was going to be driving that school bus. That school bus was supposed to be a wink of an eye. Just long enough for me to get this medical insurance to figure out how Katie can manage. Because i got to get in there. i got to do it. i got to spin plates, man. i got to get everybody. i got to hold this family together. And I thought, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Well, I drove that school bus for three years. And, uh, and unfortunately, my husband ended up dying, but he did not die of the brain tumor. The brain tumor ended up being benign. He was never going to work again. He had massive brain damage. But he was still a great guy. I mean, you would if you had lunch with him, you could tell he had brain damage. But if he was just sitting here, you wouldn't know. He didn't slobber. He didn't lose any body functions, anything like that. But he was in untreated alcoholism just like I was. And he convinced those doctors to give him anything he wanted, which is what we do, right? 
because the pain was so great and it was overwhelming and he couldn't live with what he had. And uh, he ended up dying of a heroin overdose. And that was six years into him, you know, having the brain tumor. That's what I'm talking about. So when I talk about untreated alcoholism and I talk about being a part of sick AA, I get very passionate behind it because not all of us get out the other side. And not we don't. And what ends up happening, I think, is sometimes you can be in untreated alcoholism and you say, well, I'm not going to drink. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't know where my big book is. And I mean, I, I don't, I don't really use my sponsor. And I mean, I, I read daily reflections briefly in the morning. And I mean, I don't sponsor, but I'm not going to drink. And the truth is, is what you're going to have is you're going to have a root canal because you're getting older and your teeth are getting older. <clears throat> and when you get that root canal, the doctor says, are you going to need some Vicodin? Well, by golly, I am going to need some Vicodin. And you know what? I do need some Vicodin. And that Vicodin triggers the allergy. Because when I'm spiritually fit, God makes that Vicodin medicine if necessary. But when I'm not, it triggers that allergy because I'm in the malady and I don't even know it. And that's exactly what happened to my husband. He was a, a solid member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But we had nothing but meetings, which was what I thought was fine. I really, really don't, please don't ever hear Charlie and I say there's anything wrong with meetings. We love the fellowship. We love AA. We love AA meetings. But that's all we had. That will not keep me from drinking, period. Now, it'll last a long time. I'm, I'm here to tell you it lasted 10 years. But it'll eventually, God's grace will run out, and it's like a light switch. could be a motorcycle wreck. It could be a, you know, you know wrench your knee. And you got to go under surgery for a bad knee. It could be a surgery that's simple, not life-threatening, and it triggers the allergy. And the next thing you know, you're scheduling more dental work or something, and then you're drinking. And we see a ton of people. So when we start tomorrow, Charlie will do the first step, and uh, first and second, I'll do the third, and then we'll just rock on through the weekend. And and um, thanks so much for letting me share my story. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.